But uh, we are so privileged to have as our first uh, presenter this afternoon, Dr. Antoine Laveau. Uh, he comes to us from the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. He's at the uh, mothership of the Cleveland Clinic, as he told me last night. Uh, Dr. Uh, Laveau is originally from France. I've uh, been at the Cleveland Clinic for several years now. And he's got a very novel project that he will be talking about integrating mediated communication between endothelial cells and parasites that regulates vascular function in Alzheimer's disease. I suspect many of you don't know what endothelial cells are or parasites, but he's going to tell us all about that. I also want to point out that our reviewers this year felt that this was an outstanding grant, and we have named that the Roger and Vienna Ackerman Award. This is a top and well, thank you so much for being here. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Gary, for the introduction, and thank you, all of you, for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of the research we're doing in my lab. I purposefully put the actual title of the grant, but I want you not to be worried. I'm not going to use all of those words in the rest of the <laughs> So I'm not going to introduce Alzheimer's disease to you. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with what the disease is and uh, all of the consequences that it has. But you may be more familiar that the main hallmark of Alzheimer's disease are this deposition of abnormal protein that we call plaques or we call tatango. And this has been the focus of a lot of the research within the past 15 years. And uh, we in the field actually start to believe that while this is one piece of the puzzle, this is not the entire picture. And so now we need to look at other factors that are contributing to Alzheimer's disease. And this is one of the topics that this project is about. And the topic that we are very interested in my life is actually the blood vasculature. And the reason is that is that the brain has a very unique blood vasculature. And it's designed purposefully to limit what is in your blood to be able to enter your brain. And the primary reason for that, it's purely protective. We want to be mindful about what from our blood gets into a brain and might uh, affect our brain cells. The way it does that is that those blood vessels as form of what we call those endothelial cells that actually form the tube of the blood vessel. And around <coughs> those blood vessels, you have those other cells that we call pericytes that are actually uh, forming arms around the blood vessel, and actually they're the reason why the blood vessel and the brain contract. And then those two cells have to communicate with each other for your brain vasculature to work properly. And so that's what, in a very schematic way, is how your blood-brain barrier, is what we call this very unique structure between those two cells, is working. Is that they form an actual physical barrier between your blood and your brain, and um, the junction between those cells, they are very tightly connected so that blood cannot just leak out inside of your brain. They have particular sets of molecules that actively transport molecules from the blood to the brain so that the brain selects specifically what gets in, in what quantity and where. And um, the problem is that in Alzheimer's disease, and in actually in lots, if not most of neurological dis diseases, all of that system is completely disturbed. Those uh, endothelial cells, they start degenerating, and so now blood can actually freely leak into your brain. Some of those molecules that regulate the transport, they are being dysregulated, so the brain doesn't have control anymore by what gets in and what gets out. And we think that this is one of the factors that actually contributes to Alzheimer's disease pathology. And um, this is a, 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 a summary of all of those different functions that your blood vasculature actually serves to your brain. And so you can imagine that in a condition like Alzheimer's disease, where all of those things are dysfunctional, regardless of the presence of plaques, just the sheer fact of having all of those things going wrong, this may very likely uh, impact how your brain functions. So one of the things that we're interested in in my lab is to understand more at the molecular level, something that we would be able to target, what controls the blood brain barrier and the structure to stop degenerating in Alzheimer's disease. And this is how we got interested in this particular molecule that is called CD49A, but no need to remember the name. The one thing I want you to remember is it's, what's it called? It's an integrin. 
So integrin are molecules that are expressed by cells that serve two main functions. They allow the cell to anchor themselves within their microenvironment. For the cell to be there and do its function, it needs to be staying where it's supposed to be. Integrins are some of those molecules that allows that. The other thing that integrins mediate is to have two cells talk with each other. To function properly in symbiosis, you need those integrins to be expressed by both of those cells. And we got interested in this particular molecule because um, genetic studies with Alzheimer's disease patients actually identified this particular integrin as potentially being linked to Alzheimer's disease. But so far, nobody has actually studied what that molecule is doing. And so uh, when I started my lab in 2019, we actually generated a mouse so that we can start answering those questions that we genetically modify to not be able to express this protein so that we can study what happens if this protein is not there. And so that's how this whole project started and we found that this protein here that we use a fluorescent antibody to actually label it and this is a mouse brain, it's expressed in the vasculature that you see in magenta so it's exactly where we think it will exert its function And so to make sure that it was actually relevant in the context of Alzheimer's disease, we wanted to see how is that molecule changing uh, in Alzheimer's disease. And for that, we were fortunate to collaborate with Dr. Uh, Stefan Prokop at the University of Florida that actually has a large uh, brain bank of patients with Alzheimer's disease that really help us to be able to make sure that the studies that we're doing, even though we're using mice that are animal model, are relevant for actual patients. And so um, in those pictures, we stain for CD14 in red. And you can appreciate that in patients that have Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot more of this molecule that is being expressed. And actually, when we did enough analysis with enough patients, we found that when um, the amount of the molecule being expressed is actually correlating with the cognitive capacity of the patient. So the stronger the disease was, it seems that the more that protein was expressed, which to us really was suggesting that there's something that links that molecule being overexpressed to the patient doing worse on a from a cognitive standpoint. And interestingly, in animal model, we see the exact same thing. The worse the mice are doing, the more this protein is starting being expressed. Which uh, led us to the hypothesis that we're going to uh, try to answer with this project and with the money we're getting from COUT is to uh, the hypothesis that this particular molecule actually regulates vascular function in Alzheimer's disease. And the idea is that can we reduce its expression in Alzheimer's disease and can we preserve the vascular function? And so for that, as I say, we generated a mouse where it does not express this protein so that we can start asking those particular questions. And then uh, we have also genetic model for mice to start developing Alzheimer's disease. And so, as I told you, in Alzheimer's disease, the, the brain vasculature is leaking, and so you have blood-derived factors that are starting accumulating in your brain. And this is what this picture actually represents. We stain in green and in red with two blood molecules <coughs> that normally do not get into the brain. If your brain vasculature is functional, they're completely excluded. But because those mice have Alzheimer's disease, you can see that we can start seeing some of those proteins being in the brain. But when we remove this, this integrin, which we call a knockout, then those proteins start, do not accumulate anymore in the brain. But those mice still are, technically have Alzheimer's disease, but somehow their brain vasculature was preserved. And so part of this grant is actually going to help us understand how. How is the lack of this molecule preserving the function of this uh, blood vasculature? As I showed you, there's multiple ways the brain regulates how the blood derived factor gets into the brain. So we're going to interrogate each of those pathways individually to try to really understand what does that molecule does in uh, the blood vasculature.
But aside from just this uh, basic science principle of understanding the molecular regulation, what we care about is that, do we, did, that did we affect the actual disease by modulating this molecule? And so we've looked at different parameters. And even though plaque are not always the answer, there's still a very good readout to be able to tell us how much we affect the disease. So we actually looked at the capacity of those mice to form plaques. And uh, here they're standing different colors. So in here they're in uh, green, but in this picture they're in red. And what we see is that when we remove this protein in the blood vasculature, we have those mice have less plaques than the mice that still have that protein. So it demonstrates that by regulating the vasculature, we affect the plaque pathology in those mice. But even more importantly, is what happens to the cognitive status of those mice. Because ultimately, when we're trying to design a cure for Alzheimer's, we can remove all the plaques in the world. If the patient do not do better from a cognitive standpoint, what does it matter? So ultimately what we want to do is make sure we uh, improve the behavior and improve the cognition of the patient, and in our case, the animals. So in mice, we cannot just ask them a question and, and hope that it will answer. So we have to develop tricks to figure out how well their memory are working. And so this test is called the Bonds Maze. But what it is is that it's a platform, a round platform, that has 20 drill holes at the periphery. And uh, this platform is placed in a, in a space where there's visual cue on the walls. And so mice don't like to be in the middle of an open space because that's where they're more likely to be attacked. So um, they're going to learn that under one specific of this hole, there's a cage where they can go hide. And so basically, we repeat that task every day for several consecutive days. And what happens is that mice, they're going to use those visual cues to remember exactly where that hidden location is. And so every day, they're getting better and better at finding where the location is. And we can measure the time that they take to get into the hidden place. And so those are, this is like a graphication, graphication of this. And so you see on the first day, they take a certain amount of time, but every day they get better and better at doing the test. And those are mice that are cognitively intact. So mice that do not have Alzheimer's disease, and you can see they learn very well. Now if you're uh, in green, you are mice that have Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that because of the disease, they are not as good as finding the platforms, so they're cognitively impaired. But now, if we remove our protein of interest, even though they still technically have plaques, as I showed you, they have less, but they still have plaques. From a behavioral standpoint, they behave like they don't have Alzheimer's disease. And so this um, really is leading us to the, the subject of this proposal is really understand how by removing this molecule, we manage to preserve the vascular <coughs> function in Alzheimer's disease, and we manage to preserve the cognitive function of those mice. And so those are the two main questions we're gonna be answering with the Cochrane, is that we're gonna to try to understand what actually is being regulated by this CD14A molecule. Why is the vasculature protected when CD14 is absent? Why, what is it doing in Alzheimer's disease to cause that barrier to become dysfunctional? And one of the questions we're particularly gonna be addressing is because this protein is important for the cell-cell communication and those two cells that form the blood brain barrier, they need to nicely talk to each other for the whole system to work uh, beautifully. We wanna understand how that communication may be changing when that molecule is absent. But more importantly, we want to interrogate how the loss of CD40 is affecting Alzheimer's disease pathology. We really want to understand uh, from every stand standpoint in terms of Alzheimer's disease pathology, whether it's plaque, whether it's cognitive function, whether it's neural function, really de uh, decipher how the loss of this molecule actually affected all of those. Because with the data we're going to be generating with this grant, the ultimate goal is actually to go much further with this research. And based on our data, now we want to develop tools because in mice, we can use genetic manipulation and make a mouse express and not express anything we want. This is not how we're going to treat a patient. 
So what we want to do is develop tools, whether they're small molecule, whether the gene therapy, develop some sort of pill that will allow us to diminish the expression of CD4 genetic in patient and see if we can improve uh, the same things that we see in the mice. We also want to test the timing. Is it something that we're going to be able to give patients that are already being diagnosed, that are already a little bit far along with the disease? Is this a treatment that is going to be reserved for patients that are of a higher risk, that we're going to be, as a preventive, maybe we should start giving you treatment for this to avoid the disease to further move along? And we want to go back to those initial genetic studies that actually have linked this molecule to Alzheimer's disease and see if uh, actually when you see a doctor and you have concern about Alzheimer's disease, is this a molecule that should be looked at that might uh, help um, the doctor actually decipher if you have a more likelihood of developing it or it might be an indicator of the severity of the disease you may get. So we really want to also see if this particular research may help um, define new risk factor and new diagnostic factor for Alzheimer's disease. And with that, I want to show you that thanks to the money you're giving us, it's not just for me, but it's actually for my entire team. And we're very grateful that you selected us to uh, give some money. And I have, I have a special shout out to Natalie Frederick, which is the postdoc in my lab that actually is the main leader on this project. And with that, I will take any question you may have. So that's one of the experiments we're doing right now. Because those mice that we have from birth, they don't have that molecule. Okay. So we don't know if some of what we're seeing it's because we changed how the disease started, or we should be changing the progression. And actually in the grant, we generate a new mouse model where it's not from birth. We decide when we want that molecule to stop being expressing. So we're going to be able to ask exactly those questions. We're going to take some mice where we do it early before the disease develops, or we're going to wait for the disease to be fairly implanted, then remove the protein and see if we can uh, impact the disease. Thank you. Yeah. This, the protein that's leaking into the brain, is this actually like a brain bleed type thing, or? So it's not. If it was a brain bleed, for a brain bleed, you need the barrier to be fully open. You need the gates to be fully open. In this case, you're in between. You're not fully tight, but you're not fully open. So only some molecule managed to get in, but you do not have the brain bleed itself. Okay. Yeah. Is the CD49 protein common in everyone, or is this, is this a diseased protein that occurs only in diseased individuals? So it's expressed at baseline in the endothelial cells. So the brain expressed some level of it. The what we're seeing is that in condition, in disease condition, there's more of it. So it's not an absence presence. It seems to be a level of expression differences. Yes. Uh, what would you from that uh, it, it works and uh, cures the mouse, but then it fails with a, a human, but we keep going back and trying to heal a mouse. Uh, why do we do that? Why, why do we just keep going back to mouse all the time? So it's, it's a very good point and a very fair point. The, one of the problems is that we do not have an alternative. The mouse model right now is the only way we can start something. This is where we need to gather the initial proofs so that we can move further along. I think one of the factors that has limited the translatability of some of those mouse diseases into human has been the focus on plaques. And I think because we're looking, plaques are not our focus, it's one of the factors we're analyzing. I think we're more likely to see something that may be more relevant to the human disease. I'm a true believer that it's not going to be one treatment cures everything. I think it's going to be about combination therapy. So we see some degree of efficient efficacy of removing plaques, but with antibody-mediated approach. But it did not translate into cognitive aspect. 
And what we think it's maybe because if the blood vasculature is dysfunctional, you can remove all the plaques you want. If you don't also fix the vasculature, it's not going to lead to anything. So I think by using this multifactorial aspect, we're more likely to get uh, effect in the patient. How do you detect that protein in a human patient? Um, we would have, right now, we have to use postmodern tissue. This protein happens to also be expressed in a subset of circulating cells that are in your blood. So what we're trying to, we're going to be trying to do when it's still in the early stages of development is, can we use the expression of the molecule on those circulating cells to give us an indication of what's actually happening in the brain so that we don't have to do a biopsy, so that we don't have to do any of those things. So we're trying to think about all of those questions too. If you believe it's a uh, uh, an excess of CD forty nine A, do you have a proposal way to reduce that level in humans? So yeah, there's two um, there's two different approaches we're taking. So there is, interestingly enough, there's a snake venom that actually destroys this protein. So obviously, we're not going to ask people to inject themselves with snake venom. <laughs> But at least we have a biological compound that we know does the job that we can start understanding how it works to develop something that will be much safer. So that's one of the approach. The other one is that we're still thinking, because it's the brain blood vasculature, technically if you inject something in the blood of a patient, it will be able to target those cells. So we're still exploring the idea that some gene therapy approach may be a way of reducing this protein. Could you, uh, can you actually determine whether there's, whether there's more of that protein in one individual versus another individual? So right now we don't have enough patient sample to actually answer those questions, but we're hoping that the collaboration with the brain bank, we're going to be able to um, get way more patient sample. And ultimately what I want to do, particularly at the clinic, is because the uh, amount of patients that are being seen, we may be able to start um, questioning some of the medical record and see if the level is actually correlated with something else. It's correlated with when they were diagnosed or particular uh, other disease they may already have and try to really understand what links that protein to this patient and if it's actually a protein that would be on a subset of patients that would characterize something unique about their form of Alzheimer's disease. So we're trying to get into that. Okay. Yeah, thank you for being here today. Um, have you seen, by removing this protein, a reaction, another reaction that affected the mass? So in other words, yes. that removing the protein affected it in a different way? So it's a very important question. From what we've looked at so far, we don't see it. So in some of the cognitive tests we did, we've looked at the cognition of mice that do not have Alzheimer's to actually go at some of your point exactly. We want to see are we already affecting the system by just removing that protein? From what we've looked so far, it doesn't seem like it's the case. But that's still something we're keeping an eye on because we don't want to start messing with something else because we targeted it. With, you know, introducing this molecule into the mice, and, and some of the, your post, you know, diagnosis of humans, why doesn't the body's natural defenses work against it because it's a foreign object? That's a great point. And I think that's also something that we're curious about is that why does, that to me, there has to be an initial reason why this gets upregulated. And I think in a lot of diseases, at one point we pass the point of no return and those initial uh, those initial uh, upregulation or those initial steps that were protective become detrimental. And it could be that um, initial inflammation, or if you have another disease, like something, let's say you have, uh, you hit your head, and then you have this upregulation to protect the brain at that point. But then once you introduce the plaque and it becomes something chronic, that something that was protective becomes something bad. That's my personal um, take on this. Thank you.
Joe. Thank you for an outstanding presentation. I think y'all asked so many questions because it was so understandable. But yes. thank you. <laughs> we are very privileged to give you our check for three hundred thousand dollars. It's a Roger Act of the award. Thank you. Thank you.